Hello, a very good uh, morning, good afternoon. Welcome to our live webinar trading analysis with myself, Giles uh, Cochran, uh, Chief Currency Analyst uh, working here with HYCM. I hope everybody is doing well. I hope you all had a very happy uh, New Year and a Merry Christmas. And looking forward to starting uh, the week in earnest. Don't forget, as we look at different exits, entries, different commodities, instruments for trading, the whole idea of this uh, webinar is that it is uh, not trading advice, but you're looking over my shoulder, some of the professional trading background, you see how I go about making decisions. So uh, don't forget, those of you who are regular know uh, how this uh, works. Uh, those of you who just joined for the first time today, very warm welcome. I hope you enjoy this webinar and it helps you have a better framework within which to make your own trading decisions. Now, as we start the year, we will, of course, be looking at what's coming up for this uh, week ahead. Uh, we didn't have a schedule on the uh, terminal. Uh, because of the fact that we had Christmas and New Year. But a couple of things I do want to draw our attention to alongside the actual calendar is the US dollar, we're next to the US dollar, as well as strong seasonals uh, that we have for uh, platinum. So I just want to draw our attention uh, to that. It's definitely a couple of uh, trades that look like they're uh, well worth looking at. Very, very warm welcome to Gary Kingsley. Great to have you. Happy New Year to you both. Uh, Mark, uh, Milad, Jaban, Alejandro. Uh, great to have you as well. Uh, very warm welcome. So without further ado, I'll get stuck straight into uh, the webinar. I'm just going to turn over to my other screens and we can have a look at what's ahead. Now, the market has opened up with a, a risk on till. We can see uh, that equity futures markets have been moving broadly high. We'll take a look at them at the minute. Uh, commodities have been just pushing a little bit higher as well. Don't forget, Crude Complex will be eyeing OPEC's decision uh, tomorrow, uh, and uh, markets will be seeing whether they bring on the, that extra 400,000 uh, barrels per day. So that's uh, likely to see some volatility in the oil market from tomorrow. Don't forget, today is a UK bank holiday. So as a consequence, we are see, have seen a quiet start the European session with London being away. So the first uh, day of the week is expected to be a quiet trading day and tomorrow uh, trading uh, proper should begin in earnest. So it's a low volatility day. But of course, remember, one of the flip sides of a low volatility day is it can go one of two ways. You can either have no moves at all or very large moves. And you may be confused about this. You might have seen, you know, uh, many times people say, well, it's a low volatility day. Uh, don't expect uh, much to move from the markets, then you've suddenly seen, you know, 200, 300 point moves. Uh, and you think, well, how does that work? Well, what happens is when there's very low volatility, it means that there is um, an absence of large orders in the market. So that means if significant news does break over that holiday period, you can see some huge moves because the normal, you know, cluster of buy and sell orders, which obviously slow down price, aren't there. So prices, as it were, zips through these large vacuums looking for buy and sell orders to, uh, to fill. And that's why when you have low volatile markets, you can sometimes have large ranges uh, due to the uh, reduced number of orders in the market. So just remember that, that caveat. So perversely, when you have a low uh, volatility day, you can either see very narrow ranges or outsized moves. So uh, you can get some good opportunities in markets like this if significant breaking news uh, comes across. You can see that the Asia pack, um, quite modest, uh, balanced uh, view, the Nikkei slightly uh, lower, Shanghai composite a little bit higher, um, uh, Nifty a little bit higher, S ASX 200, uh, that's the Australian uh, main index, is down lower. We can see the yens a little touch higher, Frank a, a touch higher, um, Aussie uh, a little bit. Uh, weaker and Canadian dollar a little bit stronger. So a mixed uh, picture in the FX uh, space. The major sort of data point we have today we will be looking at is the US uh, PMI data and we'll be looking in at the US dollar in a little bit more detail uh, later on during the session. So you can just see here the dollar. Now the dollars of interest right now because we have been seeing that dollar strength coming into the end of last year. Now re remember the reasons for the dollar strength. The market was increasingly expecting the Federal Reserve to become more hawkish. And if you remember, the trigger for that hawkish expectation was rising inflation. So they're the two narratives that are likely to grip both the US dollar 
and markets more generally, which is growth and inflation. So will growth slow down from 2021's sort of large sort of bounce back after COVID-19 vaccine relief? Yes, we're dealing with the Omicron surge at the moment, but most markets are pretty confident in the way that they're trading that the Omicron variant will be absorbed by uh, most major economies without the need for, for major lockdowns, with the exception, of course, of China, which we will cover, as that is an exception that's worth uh, looking at, could result in some uh, significant moves there. Uh, we're also look, looking at rising inflation. Central banks around the world have increasingly becoming concerned with inflation. The Fed uh, sort of moving away from their transitory narr narrative about inflation. Uh, Bank of Canada moving away from their a temporary inflation narrative. Bank of England with a surprise rate hike at the end of last year by 15 basis points. Uh, but you have the ECB still maintaining the, uh, that inflation is, is transitory and uh, the RBA and the RBNZ both sort of maintaining that inflation is transitory narrative. So a mixed picture amongst all the central banks, but taken as a whole, there's a general rising concern uh, that inflation is uh, an ongoing risk. So those two narratives are likely to be moving markets and influencing central policy from central banks. So they're the sort of key issues. COVID-19, if we just zoom out, uh, we can remind ourselves that yes, cases are surging, particularly here in the UK, but hospitalizations and death remain relatively calm. So as long as hospitalizations and death remain relatively low, and countries won't have to lock, lock down, from an economic perspective, it means growth can continue. So looking at COVID uh, Omicron cases at the moment, it's not the cases that's a concern, it's whether they result in extra hospitalizations or deaths. As long as countries are confident that their health services can maintain a decent level of function to deal with the rising cases, and as long as deaths are not overly accented, then that will mean countries will be able to avoid lockdowns and that is supportive for the global economy. So that results in, in a risk on bias. So the key metric to be looking at is not cases surging, it's whether hospitalizations and deaths are surging. At the moment, it's pretty stable. So that's reassuring markets. The dollar tends to see weakness into the end of the year. So you can see that from sort of, you know, the 20th of December, you can see the dollar fell from sort of just a high of around you know 96.50 ish down to sort of 95.50 ish, so sort of a roughly 100 points uh, fall. And if you just take a look at the dollar index, and I'll just call up the, the Dixie here, you can just see that that dollar weakness from like the 20th of December down to the you know last day of uh, December, you can see how much dollar weakness you tend to see. That is for a very important reason. Uh, in terms of US taxation, it is beneficial for US dollars to be recorded outside of US companies. So what often happens, accountants move dollars from the parent US company to daughter companies outside of the US for accounting reasons. Uh, that means there is a predisposition for the dollar to sell off into the new year. And if you, you know, if, if you take the whole of December, um, you, you know, you can just see you know, December as a whole tends to result in you know weakness in the dollar. And if you know, if you put that over fifty years, you can just see you know it's nearly double the amount of times the dollar falls. So obviously, there's going to be other fundamental uh, biases. Ten out of sixteen years. 25 years, 18 out of eight. So there is that predisposition for dollar weakness around uh, the entire month. But in particular, you just look at the last little bit of time, you know, 20th to the 31st of December, you see that dollar weakness really plays in. So, you know, uh, that has resulted in uh, dollar weakness coming in. Now, be aware that that dollar weakness at the end of the year often results in dollar strength at the start of the year. Now, just taking a look here from the first to the ninth, you can just see, look here, out of the last 25 years, 19 out of the last 25 years, we've seen dollar strength. So 
that's because the, the, the dollars that move out of the US companies are then brought back in at the start of January. So you see this sort of down, down dollar, up dollar pattern. Now, of course, it doesn't work all the time. You can see here that, you know, yes, it worked 19 times, but six times it didn't. So there is a predisposition, there is a bias for the seasonal patterns to not always work out. But when the seasonals uh, move together, this dollar strength could make a lot of sense. So with that being said, you want to look at the calendar. Now, taking a look at the calendar for this week, you can see it's quiet today, but we start to begin in earnest uh, tomorrow with some uh, decent uh, ISM manufacturing uh, uh, data coming out, the PMI data. Now, at the moment, and uh, don't forget that these charts um, are from my role with Financial Source, and there's a whole range of uh, resources that you can access uh, with Financial Source as an HYCM client. Um, so don't forget that opportunity. So you know, these are some of the charts that I use day-to-day uh, -to -day as a financial source analyst. Now, taking a look here at the Fed Fund futures, you can see that you know, heading into year end uh, and moving through December, the expectation of the Fed to hike. And we've got Fed Fund futures running three times uh, hikes, hikes th three times for next year, for this year rather, 2022, okay? So the Fed's expected to raise heights. Is it to control inflation? Is it because economic growth is recovering? But either way, that means that if we see some good US data, we have a predisposition for the dollar to move higher. So good data in jobs, good data across the ADP, good data across the services PMI, good data across the N NFP should all support the US dollar. Now, in particular, do look at the non farm payroll because at the last interest rate meeting, the Fed said that they might be prepared to look through employment data being a little bit weaker than they'd hoped for, given the fact that inflation is rising so much so quickly. Remember, in the US inflation is really highly politicized. I had a, a media interview with Benzinger.com uh, over in the US. And I think it was, if memory serves me right, another 20 minutes or 40 minutes I was talking about inflation. So if you can, you know, can, given the fact that they brought me on to talk about the currency markets and the fact that they had me speak for about 20 minutes, 40 minutes, just on the issue of inflation tells you how much of a hot topic it is over in the US. It certainly was a message to me. I thought, wow, this is such a hot topic. It's not that hot here in, in, in the UK and some countries are, you know, very relaxed about inflation. If you think of the ECB, Europe, think of Australia, New Zealand, uh, but in the US, it's a different picture. So one of the consequences of that is that Jerome Powell said he's prepared to look through some weaker employment data because inflation is high. So what that means is if the jobs data is good, that could really result in some strength in, say, the dollar yen, uh, particularly look out for the dollar yen or maybe some further weakness in the, the euro US dollar. So look out uh, for that. Now, the way to be looking at these uh, US data points is, is we, want to, we really want to see a cumulative picture. What I mean by that is think to yourself, what's the market going to be doing? If you just take a look at, let me just show you the COP report here from the financial source team. This is quite helpful. Um, if you just look here, you can see that the large speculators now, that's mainly the sort of fundamental com uh, community. They are long the US dollar. Now, we know why they long the US dollar because we've seen, looking at charts, dollar strength thing on expectations of Fed hiking interest rates. We know that. So, going into this uh, string of US data, investors may say, well, are these speculators correct? Uh, if the, you know, we have a string of negative uh, data prints, so the manufacturing PMI comes out weak, ADP jobs data is weak, the services data is weak, NFP is weak, then markets can think, well, actually, maybe the Fed won't be able to raise interest rates three times. Okay, so we'll start to see potentially US dollar weakness. So just look out, the market is positioning for dollar strength. Now, remember the US dollar smile theory? Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, just uh, show you that from my 
website. Here's my blog. I think you've got it here. Yeah. So remember the US dollar smile theory. The, the US dollar tends to grow when risk is off. So low risk appetite. If markets are scared, you see dollar strength. Then you see also see dollar strength if the Fed is expected to be hawkish. And at the moment, we've seen dollar strength on a hawkish Fed. Okay. Now, you tend to see dollar weakness if the Fed is dovish. So if we see negative uh, data prints coming out, if US growth starts slowing, if there's you know, skepticism about global recession. So in other words, if the rest of the world starts to look better than doing than the US, then we can see some US dollar weakness. So going into these data points, the market is positioned for a more hawkish Fed. Okay. So with that more hawkish Fed positioning going on, we now want to think to ourselves, we, as those data points start breaking, you know, are those hawks going to be vindicated? Now, if they are vindicated, remember the seasonal pattern for see dollar strength. We might see, you know, we can see on a string of good data, uh, the dollar index, uh, you know, moving back up that 96.50, 97 band ahead. Okay. So watch out for that. We are in that key support zone uh, for now, but we have to sort of really take this as a, you know, as a bunch of data points this week. So we're not looking at just one data point, we're looking at how the US dollar data points flow together in line with that US dollar strength seasonal pattern. Okay, so the best opportunity would be as follows. But these data points start surprising to the upside and then jobs data surprising to the upside on Friday would be the cherry on the cake uh, and then we look at something like dollar yen upside would be excellent and also euro us dollar downside uh, the, remember the ecb expected to keep interest rates on hold all of this year Fed expected to raise interest rates three times so that's what we'll be looking at uh, in terms of uh, the calendar that's the major event now opec are expected to announce their production uh, level change of 400,000 barrels per day so if they uh, cut more than the market's expecting uh, and they don't have their production increase, expect that to be supportive for oil. If they uh, uh, bring more barrels back into production, that would be negative for oil. The other currency to be really, country to be really aware of is China. Now, China is responding very differently to COVID-19 than the rest of the world. Now, most other major countries are trying to manage COVID Omicron variant via vaccination, particularly here in the UK. We've had a huge drive for Christmas to get as many people boosted. That means have their third vaccination as quickly as possible. China, the emphasis is more on COVID-free policy. So the emphasis is that the nation as a whole has very short, sharp lockdowns that result in no COVID in the community. That's been much harder with Omicron. Omicron is considerably more transmissible. If memory serves me right, I think up to four times more transmissible than the already more transmissible Delta variant. So China may really struggle. And if China maintain their zero COVID policy, and you start getting all these Omicron you know, clusters breaking out, then we're going to have all these major cities locking down in China, and that's going to impact supply chain issues. So one of the key risks for stocks at the moment, and you know, if you take a look at stocks, you can just see, let's just see, where is it? Hang on, let me just uh, find the... Uh, Stock chart. Oh, bear with me one moment. Sorry about this.
look at that move higher in in equities and you'll see like the santa rally played out this year which is the predisposition for stocks to raise up over christmas and the new year now stocks are moving higher on that general optimism about falling covid uh, uh, you know uh, risks and that more risk on sentiment yes omicron cases are surging but it's expected because it's less uh, has less impact than the Delta variant in terms of hospitalization and deaths, that ultimately it's going to result in lots of people having antibodies to COVID-19 and could well be the end of, of COVID-19. But in China, they have that zero COVID policy. So if they start shutting down major cities, we will likely see supply chain issues and that's going to impact the world's economy. So watch out, it's a risk that many people aren't aware of, but it is a risk that could bite market. So look in particular for a few things. So first of all, the Chinese vaccine is called Sinovax. I haven't read anything about the impact, the effectiveness of Sinovax and the Omicron variant. If Sinovax is found to be effective against the Omicron variant, China could well reverse their zero COVID policy, which could be very positive for risk. So watch out for that. Also, watch out for news of further lockdowns in China on Omicron breakouts. Remember, China has the Winter Olympics coming up around the start of February. So it's unlikely they're going to elect COVID-19 let rip before the Winter Olympics in February, because I want to keep that as locked down as possible so that they can uh, have host the uh, Winter Olympics for the world. They won't want to, to jeopardize that, particularly, you know, how... Um, much effort and uh, you know etc goes into huge events like that but we want to run that um, but then once that is passed just watch out for any shift from china it can be very positive for risk but if they maintain that zero free covid policy then that's going to be a risk uh, for equity markets in particular and also would be a risk for some of those more positive uh, risk on currency pairs like the New Zealand dollar, Japanese yen, the um, Australian dollar, Japanese yen, et cetera, et cetera. So let me just, uh, you know, one pair that I'm currently long on is New Zealand dollar, Japanese yen, and, and looking for that to really take, uh, take off with the RBNZ expected to raise interest rates to 2.6%, right, next, uh, by 20, end of 2023. So you can see here, you know, just up against that key trend line, you can see that key trend line there, just being tested. You can just see price moving back above. We've got the Harami and stuff by false break. That could start moving higher. Uh, that would be very positive. But one key risk would be if China maintains their zero free COVID policy and we could see the um, yen see bids and that would push the pair lower. But, you know, any retracement back down to 76 does look attractive still okay so any retracements back down to 76.50 even on a risk on tone uh, could would look attractive but just remember that you know the risk here is that the, the pair keeps falling so if you do look at, at entering this market make sure you find the key level to define the limit risk you can see from a swing trade perspective one sort of very uh, easy entry is at market and stops just below the low you can see you have a harami inside bar false break harami inside bar and enter at market stops below the low looking for a move back up to 82 and then at 82 84 clears can potentially look up you know back up to 90 so don't forget that the basis of this trade is the rbnz expected to raise interest rates to 2.6 percent in 2023 back of japan still at minus 0.10 percent and likely to stay uh, with interest rates low for the foreseeable future you can see the yield differential between the new zealand 10-year and the Japanese uh, ten-year, you can see that yield differential remains uh, wide. So you would anticipate price to catch back up to the, um, the bond yield spread. So you'd expect this price to move higher. But just be aware at the moment when that sort of key overhead resistance level. Um, but that's the risk. If China, you know, start supply chain starts getting hit, we could see this pair drift back lower again. So just to be aware of that. Uh, even though the broad medium term outlook remains to the upside for New Zealand dollar Swiss franc, New Zealand dollar 
uh, Japanese uh, yen as well. Um, Aussie yen, we've seen some good upside in Aussie yen during the course of uh, the year, particularly at the end of the year and at the start of this New Year's, the RBA sort of moves past their peak bearishness. We see you breaking through the 100, 200 exponential moving average. Okay, folks, um, that is the key issues. Does anyone have any questions to ask or anything in the chat box? But that's the main things to be looking at as we start the session for this week. Don't forget, we'll be back here on Wednesday and we will look at the ADP jobs data in uh, detail. I will recap on where we're at with the US dollar picture. So don't forget that will be taking place on Wednesday. I'll send out a reminder on my LinkedIn feed and on Twitter. So if you're not following me on Twitter, just uh, follow me here. And I do put out um, the reminders about when my webinars are taking place, just like I did today. And you can see my Twitter handle is at Giles Cochran CCA. Okay. And you also get the week ahead webinar links just on the top of the page there. So you know, if you're looking at that, do look at it. Oh yes, one seasonal pattern I forgot to mention, which is platinum. Now platinum is a very, very strong start of the year. And there's, there's a good reason for it. Now, if you look at platinum from, you know, today through to about the middle of Feb, let's take it roughly, look at the strength in platinum. You know, in the last 25 years, it's only lost value uh, three times out of those 25 years. Maximum gain has been over 33.39%. Now that is due to some strong strong seasonal uh, patterns that take place in platinum now that is due to purchase managers making orders for platinum at the start of the year so a lot of this is to do with business planning uh, platinum purchases get made uh, at the start of the year for that calendar year uh, and purchase managers platinum that you know they're not speculating in the markets that either don't know or don't care they just want to make their orders for industrial uh, usage so platinum does tend to see strong gains around the start of the year it's a strong seasonal pattern okay folks hope that's been helpful uh do of course uh, don't forget to um let's tune in on wednesday and i hope you all have a very very good trading week thank you all very much and a happy 2022 to you all thank you now goodbye